20 miles off the coast of Uganda, in the unpredictable waters of Lake Victoria, lies an island full of mystery. Unknown even to the local residents, it is an island of musical rocks. Numerous prehistoric stone gongs sit silently beneath the huge granite boulders that characterize Lolloway Island. The music of the rocks is soon to be reawakened. In response to this uniquely spiritual setting, rarely visited by outsiders, the Ruinzori Sculpture Foundation has organized a crossover music and visual arts project that will use the ancient rock gongs to inspire a contemporary music performance and exhibition. A group of traditional Ugandan musicians are being taken to Lolui Island by the foundation to collaborate with contemporary classical composer Nigel Osborne and three British musicians from the London Sinfonietta. British sculptor Peter Randall Page will also work alongside the musicians with Ugandan sculptors. This is Peter. Hello, Peter. Two sculptors. Yeah, I'm getting more and more excited as I mean. go past actually and this place is the piece of it is what I love. As a musician, there's no mechanical sound. It's, it's all natural and it's just bliss. I mean, even the pigeons are not quite the same sound. Uh, frogs are definitely not the same sound. Yeah. That's lovely. It's lovely to, lovely to hear all that, you know, just to know that these, it's all these sounds to work with. It's just brilliant. We've met two of the Ugandan musicians now, and they travelled with us. And I think they're probably trained in a very different way to we are. And they obviously play a very different style of music, and so we just have to listen uh, and see how we can contribute as well. Yeah. Uh, we've done a deal, I'm going to teach them some Scottish and Irish folk music and we'll have an exchange of, uh, uh, of musical uh, inspiration in that way. Before I came, colleagues were sort of suggesting a little bit of cultural imperialism here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's likely to be the other way round. I mean, I just play the trombone. Yeah. I don't know any folk music. Uh, in fact, we haven't really got any folk music. I don't play any other instruments. I suspect these guys have got a whole lot more to teach us than we've got to teach them, which doesn't mean to say that things can't move in both directions. But I, I'm a bit apprehensive about that, to be, to be honest. <laughs> but the other thing, big thing, of course, is the rock gongs. And so we'll be um, looking forward to working with those. Uh, in the next days, I hope. So it's very exciting. Recording, trying to work out how to get the best sounds out of them. This is a very beautiful place here on the, on the very northeastern edge of uh, Lake Victoria. Uh, and over there is our island out, and there's the magic shapes on the horizon. I think one of those must be our island. The Ruinzori Sculpture Foundation is keen to encourage cross disciplinary work. The London Sinfonietta regularly explores links between different art forms, but the aim of this island project is to allow artistic experimentation in a broader cultural landscape. How classical Western music styles are combined with traditional Ugandan instruments and rhythms, and how everyone responds to the ancient ring of the gongs, is fertile new ground for both sculptors and musicians. I'm really interested to see what these gongs, these stone gongs, are going to be like and, and what sort of sound they make, because I've got a long-standing interest in the relationship between shape and sound. And I've done quite a lot of projects working with composers and musicians on that kind of idea, really. And it's, you know, great. I've just been meeting some of the um, Ugandan musicians, and that's going to be very exciting. The closer we got to the the more these waves picked up, and the only way to, to get your boat onto the shore is to go as fast as you can straight at the shore and you hope you beach. And then of course once the tip of the boat is on the beach, the back of the boat is low and the waves start crashing into the boat. And of course all hell breaks loose because the boat starts to sink. Your bags are on them and there's a lot of important valuable, I mean some of the electronics and some of the recording gear and so on. And we all started getting drenched and you know we're all worried because there's Bill Hunt here. <laughs> So uh, it was a, a nightmare. Well, I didn't feel too good on the boat because I was sick, actually. But uh, I was dying with fever. 
but anyway, all is well. We've arrived. Nature taking its course here. It's wild water. This is a tune from Shetland, okay. island very north of Scotland. Mm. It's a tune from sailors who, when they went to hunt for whales. Mm. The visitors' camp is the perfect setting for cultural exchange. The camp team have transported all the provisions they need and prepare a healthy breakfast to fortify the artists for the walk in search of the mysterious gongs. Five miles across from east to west, in the world's largest tropical lake, Lolloway Island has no need of roads. It remains isolated by its 25 fathom deep waters and sudden storms. The idea is to seemingly thrust the artists back into a prehistoric era when Africa was still the cradle of mankind. A time when the grass plains and granite tours were home to ancestors who played the oldest musical instruments known to man. The, the same melody we yes, have it for the sailors. Really? The, 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 the piece we have been singing is really? the sailing. Really? Yeah, it is, it is, it is mentioning about the water. Well, there you are. Yeah, it is Maybe for where sailing. they got it. Only three rock gongs were documented on Lolloway Island in 1961. Over 40 years later, this project discovered a fourth set of gongs on the other side of Garofa fishing village. The place itself is extraordinary because it's a very bittersweet place. It's, um, it's a very clean and a very dirty place. It has all the opposites in it. The last permanent residents of the island were evacuated in 1908 due to a sleeping sickness epidemic. The current settlers are recent migrants who are unaware the gongs can be played. I pretty much risked my life climbing over those rocks. My heart was pumping faster than I can drum. But what's it all about if you can't do this and you come 3,000 miles to play some rocks? Well, you, know, you get up there and do it. This is also a place where they bury the dead, I think, just beyond here. You sense that. You see the pelicans, the monkeys, the monitor lizards, and the dead, and the sun, and the rocks, and the sea, and the boat. It's uh, very strange. Things that maybe in European modernism we regarded um, as being avant-garde discoveries, discoveries of nature, in fact are here and were discovered by our you know, ancestors sitting and playing these things. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful depth of sound. And this extraordinary mixture of harmonic beauty and dissonance all in one. You know, this extraordinary discovery of the world of sound and vibration. You know, this, this is the closest we'll ever get to understanding nature. I'm really interested to know whether there is a way in which one can make something which has both a, a visual and, a, and an auditory synchronicity, if you like, where the, the way it looks and the way it sounds both come together to create a phenomenon which is more than the sum of the parts. But it would be wonderful if certain shapes made certain sounds which went together and complemented one another. When the shape is right, it kind of has a, has a sort of ring to it. I mean, obviously not an audible ring, but it has a kind of hum of rightness, a sort of tone of rightness about it, which is very difficult to describe. And actually, the only way I can really think of it is in, in musical terms. When I'm making sculpture, I often think of it rather like tuning a musical instrument. The Western Orchestra is a, a rather nice resonator. Uh, it has a great potential for a wide range of colour and resonance and I intend to put the resonance of these rocks into the orchestra uh, and express their logic through the resonance of the orchestra to express their monumental nature through 
the blocks of sound and sections, one that follows another, one that comes on top of another. I don't know why, why they become so beautifully rounded, and also they seem to split very cleanly um, and in seemingly fairly random sort of places, which I'm, I really don't understand geologically what that's all about, but they are absolutely magnificent forms and uh, quite stunning, incredibly sculptural and quite the most beautiful rocks I've ever seen, I think. But the pictures up here are fantastic. This one here, I mean, it's just like a bell. I mean, I've played with bells in schools and so on that uh, ring much less than that. It's really quite a fantastic piece of rock. The ones that the guys are playing down there at the moment that you can hear, they also seem to ring and they sit loose. So I think there's something really special going on here in the way these rocks are created. If we remember the Stone Age time, maybe during that Stone Age time, and before the current instruments we are looking at, they might have played the stones because now we are we are now, we have, we have decided to play the stones as an adventure, and uh, we are getting out the melodies where they, those two have been playing, which we claim for ancestors. Maybe that's, the beginning was here. You can't play pentatonic there, because no string can reach that tone. Unless if we are, it is a composition in the Western style that can fit on the other ones. Nigel, David and myself are gonna listen to all the spectrums I'd photograph them, notate down the, the best playing spot on each one, so we can go home and write them up um, and record them very accurately. I climbed up into the, the um, area underneath that huge rock at the top, and in that almost perfect dome, uh, which is presumably a naturally occurring thing, there are some amazing rock drawings really done in ochre, and I've just been up there and, and sketched some of them, well sketched all of them actually, and documented them quite thoroughly in a series of drawings and photographs. And uh, it, it's quite phenomenal to think that, you know, I may, may well have been the first person to actually go up there and draw these things. Ugandan folk music is based on a pentatonic scale. So to discover a more worn gong in perfect tune with this five note scale, below less indented rocks that resonated to higher western pitches was very moving. And searching for the next goal gives time for reflection. It's possible that the pentatonic scale system itself can come from something like this, inspiring song in one of the most anciently populated parts of Africa, what was pretty much the cradle of civilization. It's just not too, not too hard to believe that um, perhaps music and song started in this place. This particular scale system uh, helped to clarify traditional song. This gong has over 20 different playing positions. And what was really interesting was that the, the classically trained musicians, we sat back and these young African guys from Kampala were just straight in there with the most extraordinary pattern. And obviously, they're, they're rhythms that they know themselves. But they're straight in and they're working really hard and hurting their hands and uh, hitting them hard and loud and getting the incredible excitement going. And what was interesting is the one um, of us European visitors who was really going for it was Peter, the sculptor, who was doing all sorts of interesting experiments and scraping the rock with the stone to get a sort of scratching effect and all these things, really, really going for it and getting kind of physically involved. And it, it says something about the way that we are as musicians and the way that they are as musicians. And, it, you know, it reflects quite badly on us, I think, in some ways. When I play it, I feel like I'm playing this elephant. And I think if we get more time, get organized, and uh, try to get proper stones, I think, and proper chosen pieces, 
we may form out something which is more wonderful than what we have done. Because today, today was just a trial. We can't carry this with us, <laughs> so, uh, so we, have to, we have to work through the medium of recording. Uh, but also just to record the sounds and, and isolate these beautiful harmonies. It would have been, I mean, we could actually take that sound, as you know, in the studio and we could just hear it as, as the pure resonance harmony. And it would be very nice to, to do something uh, with that. And slowly again, slowly. Very slow. Just, just one note. I mean, the, the individual sounds in themselves are wonderful, um, and the, the unusual resonances. And I'm kind of half torn to thinking it's, it's the cave that's making the resonance, but it's not. It's, it's the stone, because if you hit on the other side, actually there's no sound at all. It's a phenomenon that actually um, I'm quite familiar with from, from working with stone and piling stones up one on top of the other, and just knowing that when you hit a stone that's under certain sorts of pressures from other weights, and it's particularly if it's pinched, um, like this one is. I mean, this is sitting there bearing on a very, very small area. This thing's got to weigh several hundred tons, I would think. But to see it on this scale and to see that people have obviously used it in this way from the marks on the stone for, you know, goodness knows how long, um, it's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> phrasing that you use on patterns, Bernard, I was looking at what you're playing and thinking, how would I write that down? And I could write it down, but it would never sound the same if I played it. Whereas the way you guys do it, it, ro it rolls yeah. like a rock down a hill. Now, if you count our way, one, uh, 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 it doesn't fit. It doesn't, it's not, it's it, 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 to, to the way that we write, yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah. If you write the rhythms, when I try to interpret them, mm -hmm. you will see them blocking. But ours has almost the same, same, same demis quivers, whereby it's the chain of the metal is running one after the other. They keep on running, they keep on running, they keep on running until maybe you end. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you put those flavors, the flows behind, which may be harmonizing the original notes, and then you keep on running like that. Yes. I live on the edge of Dartmoor and uh, of course I'm used to granite outcrops and, and tours and so on but the scale and the beauty of, of these geological formations is quite breathtaking. I work primarily with stone and often with naturally occurring eroded boulders. I mean the whole island consists of eroded, beautifully rounded and very sculptural granite outcrops. My response to it has been to actually work on one particular rock which was naturally split in half here where we're camping. I've tried to encapsulate that whole sense of sound coming out of the centre of a rock by inscribing these low-relief concentric patterns on the, on the split surfaces, and I'm using ochre to sort of highlight that. <laughs> When tools were in short supply, the sculpture team used local materials to make their own. They had lent their mallets to the musicians, who were now testing tones at the rock gong above the camp. To me, I feel if we could find the strongest tones like this, the strongest sound, you hear it. There is something which is natural. Just hit that with the wood now. Hit that with the wood, exactly the same. Okay, can we can we uh, can we really hear this? That is okay. Now the stone. Shh shh shh. The sound is across. And the wood. Hold it, there's still some talking. By me? Brilliant. There, there. Yes. Yeah. Okay, just one note. Okay, and now just once. Just one note. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> if you get a stone which you can hold properly and it can give that weight properly, because these stones, some of them are very small, as you hit, it keeps on reducing itself. By the end, it has remained very small. That also affects the product. And exactly the same again, once more. Thank you.
when I was thinking about doing something here, I was very uh, dubious about the idea of doing anything which was too much of a, a bold kind of intervention, a permanent intervention in the place. In the event, I have actually carved into stone, which I didn't think I was going to do, partly because the scale of this thing, it makes it m less like part of the landscape. It's not like one of these big boulders that's actually embedded in the ground. It's small enough to be a, an artifact, to be a thing, um, rather than to be part of the landscape. I'm going to uh, work the other one with a mirror image of this pattern. Um, and then I'll roll that one over and I'll roll that one that way so that they're sitting in the correct orientation as if they'd just broken apart. And they are part of the same, you know, they're two halves of one rock. The music and uh, the sound that come from the stone also inspired me a lot. The integration actually is in the Western kind of music and our own African sound. We're all sitting around in a circle and making music together and we're not reading anything. We're using our ears. We're listening to each other and we're learning it by ear. So I've learned to tune uh, with my colleague here, Kim, on the flute, and I've begun to learn the rhythm. It's not quite how I expected. It's much more complex in the middle. I'm just beginning to feel it now. It's rather nice, this whole project to do with music. Actually having carving to this music as well is great. Liberating. It doesn't come better than this when musicians sit down for the first time to play. The outcome, the melody, has been the best. We are all one. I've come to believe that music can talk without any other language. This instrument, the violin, it comes from an instrument that came from the Arabic world in, in the 12th, 13th centuries uh, to Europe. And the same Arabic instrument, the rebab, influenced the tuba fiddle. These are relatives. They come from the same genes, musical genes. <laughs>